airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. Dunstan Bruce is perhaps most famous for his lead vocals and listing of libations in the Chumbawamba pop hit Tub Thumping. But there's so much more to him and the band than that one song. So for the hour, we touch on some of the band's 30-year history, the relationship as a collective anarchist band to social justice movements around the world, and how they used their fame and money to give back. We also hear about Dunstan's recently finished documentary, I Get Knocked Down, The Untold Story of Chumbawamba, and his accompanying one-man show, Am I Invisible Yet?, alongside of topics like aging and the battle for relevance, staying involved in politics, and other topics. I Get Knocked Down is still seeking distribution, so it's not streamable anywhere online yet, but keep an eye on their Facebook page for updates on that. And you can find his prior documentary on Chumbawamba, published about 20 years ago on YouTube, entitled Well Done, Now Sawed Off. You can find a rather embarrassing mixtape from us from 11 years ago on archive.org, which I'll be updating the playlist to soon. And if you look at the show notes for this episode, you can find links to a bunch of those documentaries, to trailers from other of Dunstan's films, uh, to related musical projects, and a whole lot more. A couple of quick announcements. Greg Curry, a prisoner in Ohio serving a life sentence in relation to the Lucasville uprising of 1993, for which he claims innocence, has begun a hunger strike for being stuck in extended solitary confinement known as TPU at Toledo Correctional Institution. To voice concern, you can call 419 726 seven nine seven seven and select a choice eight to speak to the warden during business hours monday through friday nine to five uh, or you can select zero to speak to an operator at other times and you can also email harold may at harold dot may at odrc dot state dot oh dot us to request that greg's communications be reinstated and that he be able to re-enter general population and another quick announcement in relation to our conversation a couple weeks ago with Liaison Wakest about alternative social media and the Fediverse, Final Straw now has a podcasting instance using the app Castapod that was mentioned. It's by no means meant to replace our normal podcasting feed, but if you're on the Fediverse, it could be kind of fun to play with. You can find it through a web browser at social.ungovernavl it's like ungovernable but avl for Asheville and no e at the end dot org so social.ungovernavl.org and you can find us via the Fediverse at the address at the final straw radio at social.ungovernavl.org also, keep an eye out for a new documentary coming out by Submedia about social media and some of the antics and dangers associated with it. You can find this documentary out in June on the site sub.media, and I'm sure they'll put out plenty of announcements and trailers on, on their various social media platforms. Finally, the May episode of Bad News, Angry Voices from Around the World which is an English-language monthly podcast made up from reports from different anarchist radio projects from around the world, will be available at the A-Radio website. That's a-radio-network.org, and we'll link it in our show notes. So would you please introduce yourself for the audience with your name, preferred gender pronouns, location, and any other things that you'd like to mention? Yeah, my name is Dunstan Bruce. I'm a 61-year-old man, uh, and I'm living in Brighton. In is that sufficient? Is that enough? No, oh, that's great. Actually, that's the first line. I do a one-man show, and that's that's the that's sort of the part and the film actually both start with me going. My name is Dunstan Bruce. Uh, I'm a 61-year-old man, and I'm struggling. I'm struggling with the fact that we all seem to be going to hell in a handcart, etc., etc., etc. Anyway. So we just got a preview of the introduction of of, uh, of the One Nine Show then. Yeah. That's great. I'd reached out to you first up because I and my co-hosts are 
and have been for a long time huge fans of Chumbawamba. Um, and secondly, because you've recently released a documentary entitled I Get Knocked Down, The Untold Story of Chumbawamba. So congratulations on, on the film release at South by Southwest. And, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing it. I was just going to say it hasn't actually been released yet because uh, we've been showing it at film festivals, but you can't, you can't see it anywhere just yet. Um, we're in the process of making that happen. So hopefully that'll all happen this year. But um, don't go looking for it just yet because you won't find it anywhere. We're still doing various film uh, festivals and stuff like that and trying to sell the film. Yeah. It's a long, arduous process. or It is still being a long, arduous process. So when you say sell, sell the film, you mean getting a production company to to do distribution and and everything? Is that kind of what that looks like? Yeah, no, um, no. It's, it's uh, we've got a sales agent who's trying to sell the film to distributors and broadcasters and platforms around the world now, um, and that's just time consuming. So we're at that stage. We've 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 shown the film at quite a few film festivals, and it's done really well on the festival circuit. What's happened with the film a lot is the is that people have uh, we get a lot of feedback about people really loving the film, but it doesn't fit into any uh, category or genre quite easily because it's a music documentary, but it's not a traditional music documentary, and it's not a music documentary about the Rolling Stones or Bob Dylan or uh, anybody else who uh, sells millions and millions and millions of records who have a ready-made audience for a documentary. So we found it difficult to get broadcasters in- interested in the documentary because nobody, uh, because that world is so conservative and safe. People don't like taking risks with stuff. And so I think we've made a documentary that's quite challenging and uh, innovative and um, fun and uh, and a lot of the feedback we get is that yeah we really loved it but they they won't take a risk with the uh, with the documentary because it's not a straightforward history it's not a straightforward history of a of a band really it's a it's a bit more uh, convoluted than that I can't imagine it's kind of um, subjective what is the format like how does it differ from if any of the listeners have 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 seen uh, Well Done Now Sought Off, for instance, which was made, what, like 10, 10 12 years ago? I, no, no, 20 years ago, excuse 20, me. 20 years ago. 20 years ago, yeah. <clears throat> so Well Done Now Sought Off was like, that was more of a like potted history of the band. And that told the story uh, a lot more of, uh, you know, the, 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 the band's uh, formation and uh, goes through uh, the history of the band up until 2000 when uh, uh, that documentary uh, was finished. This film, we didn't want to remake that film. That wasn't the point of going going back to try and tell the story of Chumbawamba. So this film is a bit more uh, exploratory in uh, in in what it's trying to do, and is less about the potted history of Chumbawamba and is more about uh, my own story, which means that the film has a contemporary element as well. And so we've taken the song, we're using the song, uh, the tub thumping, you know, I get knocked down, but I go up again, as a as a sort of a, a, a sort of a Trojan horse in a way, as a way, as a means of telling uh, a, a, a larger story. And uh, so my time in Chumbawamba is just part of, you know, it's part of the film, uh, a very important part of the film and a, and a large part of the film. But the, but the fact of the matter is that we're, we're, we're trying to explore more ideas about what can you achieve when you enter the mainstream and what happens when uh, that fame is over and what do you do to carry on being relevant and being visible and uh, uh, being a part of, uh, you know, some sort of continuum of dissent or some sort of movement to try and still change the world. So it explores more that those ideas about, you know, about... Um, you know, getting older as well, you know, and what, what do you do? Yeah, that's really awesome. And I'm very glad to hear that that's what it's about, because that's kind of the line of, of questions that I was hoping to, to go into. Oh, um, <laughs> because I think that like one, one thing, you know, like you mentioned as a Trojan horse, it's, it's kind of perfect for that. There's, there's two 
big, in my estimation, there's two big pop songs that I came across with Chumbawamba that, that stand out aside from me delving into y'all's discography, Tub Thumping and then Top of the World. And um, those really, like if, if you say Chumbawamba to a lot of people, those are going to be the the point of contact that they have. Oh, that band that did that one song that was great in the pub or whatever. And that's kind of what your earlier documentary points to when it's, you know, at the opening, when it's got all these newscasters saying, Chumbawamba, Chumbawamba, Chumbawamba. <laughs> yeah. Or like, you know, the talk show circuit, that's always the point of introduction. And it really allowed for the opportunity to, as other members of the band talked about talk about politics on on daytime talk shows and in the u.s at least and in the uk to a degree or um be able to be featured as the you know uh opening performers at you know major musical events and also insert your critiques of how for instance new labor dealt with the dock worker strikes or um directly confront politicians or or corporate in individuals about their uh, their sliminess i think that that seemed to be like the one of the major positives to come out of the 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 crack into pop music that you all made that, yeah i mean yes that's exactly right yes <laughs> you've answered the question with your question really <laughs> I've got, I've got nothing to add on that. That's like a perfect summation of it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not a very good interviewer, <laughs> <laughs> but a good critiquer. Oh, thank so. you. Um, well, so you know, since I mentioned those two, those two hits, and and I know there were others, like Enough yeah. Is Enough, hit hit like, uh, you know, hit the hit the charts at some point, for instance. But um, can you talk a bit about the the history of the band? I mean, it spanned decades. There were no numerous musical styles that came up outside of what you hear in those two hits and maybe talk about the band's expectations of itself and how that changed with exposure and, and like the scope of the, with the idea of fame. Yes. Yeah, so Chumamba started in 1982, really. Um, we, we were we, in those early years, those first few early years, we were very heavily influenced by uh, Crass, you know, an anarcho punk band from uh, the UK who were huge, absolutely huge. Uh, were sold Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of records, yet never um, n were never included in any charts or anything. Uh, although they were absolutely massive, we were really heavily influenced by what they were doing. They they lived in a commune uh, down south in the south of England, and uh, we found their way of uh, uh, trying to express their politics at first really really inspiring. It was it was a way they were talking about anarchism in a way that made it seem. Uh, sexy and rock and roll and uh, exciting um, rather than uh, any sort of like, you know, rather than having to attend uh, endless, you know, uh, boring political meetings, we just found that uh, that was a much more interesting and exciting way of expressing our politics and being, invo and being involved in politics. So the first few years we were sort of influenced by what they were doing. But then what we tried to do was um, then we tried to... Uh, make a conscious decision to step out of that uh, uh, movement that, that felt as though it was increasingly becoming a ghetto of its own making. And we always had this idea that we wanted to talk to the rest of the world, that we weren't particularly interested in staying in our, in our little safe uh, little bubble. So um, how our, our first attempts at doing that was by changing our style of music. We wanted to make a style of music. We wanted to make a style of music that was a bit more um, accessible to people. And, you know, the music that we were listening to was like, you know, was stuff that was like included, you know, three or four part harmonies and uh, or was pop music or and it, and it was or it was music that was used humor in a way uh, of trying to get its point across rather than uh, rather than just shouting and screaming in people's faces. We didn't necessarily think that that was a. Uh, um, the most effective way of trying to convince people that there was a, a, a better way of doing things. So we sort of started to change our music and we were like, we would always bring in any sort of influences that we had from the outside world. So uh, in the 80s, you know, we were quite, sort of quite heavily into, uh, we'd got into Irish rebel music and English folk music became a part of what we, what we were doing. Um,
then in the then in the late eighties, when uh, uh, dance music started to uh, uh, become a, a, a huge movement uh, in the UK in particular, we sort of embraced all of that, and uh, we started to make music that was that reflected the times a bit more. And at the same time, we sort of just started changing the message of what we were saying within our music. We spent a lot of the early years complaining about everything, basically. And I think we reached a point where we thought, look, that's great, complaining about anything, but why don't we celebrate some things as well? And there was an album in particular, an album called Slap, uh, that came out, I think, at the, at the end of the 80s, I think, maybe, uh, that started to celebrate little, uh, you know, little acts of resistance or small victories. And we changed the emphasis in the songs. We started to have a lot more fun on stage. Sorry, my cat's in the, in trying to get into my bed and it's making a lot of noise and distracting me. So I don't like. Um, anyway, we we so we were like um, we changed what we were doing uh, musically and lyrically, and uh, and and started having fun. You know, being on stage and with our records, and that carried on throughout the nineties. Um, that we were just having a you know we were just uh, we were working together. We were a collective. And we were on independent record labels, various labels. We moved from one to another, and um, and that seemed to be that seemed to work um, as a as a sort of like I suppose as a business model, if you want to call it that. We found we were very self sufficient, very DIY, and we managed to uh, exist as a band by touring constantly. You know, we got to travel the world because of that. When tub thumping came along. That was not something that we planned at all. We didn't sort of reach a point where we thought, right, we're going to have to have a hit record. We were sort of like trundling along quite nicely. Um, things had gone a little bit. With, things had gone a little bit off the boil just before that. Just before we made that album, but so we had this big. You know, we had a couple of big meetings where we decided. You know, we were going to give it one last shot. Basically, uh, you know, we got to put everything into doing this album. And out of that came tub thumping. Um, and so at the time, we didn't realise, you know, what we'd done or, you know, what that song was or what that song was going to mean to so many people. We just thought, right, we've got ourselves back on track. We've made an album that we really like. Um, right, let's go and start uh, trying to put this record out. So the label we were on at the time was One Little Indian, which was uh, run by, uh, actually run by some old friends of ours. It used to be in a band called Flux of Pink Indians. They didn't like the album. They basically told us to go away and re-record the album or they'd get some producers in to produce it for us. So we were furious about that. Uh, we were like, no, we, we, you're not going to do that. We think this album's great. So we left the label. Uh, we just like, we saw like, well, all right, right, we're going to go and put this record out somewhere else. And so we had to get up, so we had to find a way of putting it out. And so we had some old friends who used to be, uh, they used to manage uh, the likes of Hawkwind and Motorhead back in the 70s. And um, they took the album and um, basically touted it around various people and uh, it garnered a lot of interest. And so we ended up having all these. Uh, 
all these uh, offers from major labels, you know, from around the world to sign a to sign a record deal with them. What happened at that point was um, we we had no idea what we created, and uh, we made the so we made the decision that um, why don't we take a leap in the dark in, in a way and sign to a major you know sign to a major label and just see what happens you know just see if anything amazing happens or you know if it goes wrong uh we we were about to get a huge advance um so at least we would have that money and we could do something with that and keep the band going for a couple of years just on that money and so all those things all those things happened you know we we signed uh we signed a a deal with EMI Germany, much to the much to the chagrin of a lot of uh, former hardcore Chumbawamba fans who obviously felt like we'd sold out because, uh, you know, back in the uh, was it in the eighties or the early nineties, we'd 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 appeared on this uh, we'd appeared on this album, this compilation album called Fuck EMI, and um, so it seemed like the most hypocritical thing we could have done was to sign to EMI. Um, but that's what we did because we had always believed that we should do what we felt was best for us and not what our audience expected of us. We always wanted to challenge everybody's uh, preconceptions about the band and we always wanted to do something that was interesting and exciting and different for us to keep us engaged in the whole process. So we signed to EMI. Germany and we signed to Universal in the in the States. And then obviously the song was an enormous, enormous hit. And we had no idea that was going to happen. We had absolutely no idea. And it was uh it was as it was as big a shock to us as it was to, you know, uh Chumbawamba fans that suddenly we had this song that was absolutely huge. So once that happened, you know, we had to think, right, what are we going to what are we going to do now? You know, what do we do with this success? How do you, you know, how do you negotiate that, you know, the world that we were thrown into? And uh, we just made the decision that we'd got we had to make the best of it because we realized that that day would not last forever. It's going to be it's going to be a a couple of years of sort of intense activity. Um and we got to we got to do something with that platform. Because as we thought, how often does anybody, you know, get that sort of global audience and that opportunity to speak to so many people outside of their um, their fan base? You know, and you don't usually you don't get them opportunities. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity for us, and so we decided to try and use it to be as subversive as possible and to and to help as many people, you know, that we could, uh, and uh, to just use the position to um amplify other people's struggles and get involved in uh you know advocating and agitating you know around you know as many issues as we could and bring them bring those things to the fore in that in that small window of opportunity that we had and that's what we did so a few years ago and uh correct me if i'm wrong remembering this but i i recall and this might <laughs> when i say a few years covid has done some amazing things to our our chronological memory maybe this was up to 10 years ago but uh some members of crass had decided to challenge legally um some of their albums being distributed for free online because they weren't you know these are people that had been making music 40 or 50 years ago and they weren't making any money off of it and suddenly they were saying well our stuff is out there everywhere it'd be nice to to have a little bit of money for retirement because austerity has kicked in and nobody's making money and so a lot of people reacted to that as like well these people are you know charlatans these people are sellouts they made this music this long ago and um they were handing out albums for free why can't we distribute it for free I'm I'm a big advocate of distributing music and art for free and also choosing to support artists when you can afford to but also you know it's it's there's a there's a commons of knowledge and a commons of creation and no one's building in a bubble but I guess I'm I'm asking this to sort of or I'm bringing this up to sort of ask about the question of um when people were saying that you all were sellouts like it's obvious that you had critiqued EMI but what was the studio system like at the time and how was that shifting and and where was that value of DIY and small labels coming from 
was it that you were going to change your values in terms of what you were talking about or be less accessible? No, 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 we didn't. We didn't change what we, we took. We, if anything, we amplified what we were talking about um, because we felt as though we had a bigger responsibility to use the platform and not abuse it. Um, so I think I think what we I mean, I, when the album came out, that was just pre iTunes and pre Napster just so we were on the cusp of all that that big shift that huge shift um and, but we were on we were just before it basically so um so we so th- so that um so we were still dealing in physical copies of you know records and and stuff like that and uh you know, in uh, uh, CDs and, and cassettes and vinyl and stuff like that. That was that. Well, that was still our world around that time. Um, I think we felt like it was um, we'd made a living up to that point, largely from touring and selling merchandise and selling records on tour. So we we already had a model that we were like using. Uh, to keep the band going, and that model never, never was anything to do with selling records. Weirdly, because we never sold enough records for that to be a way of us making a living. We always knew that we could go, we could go on tour around Europe for six weeks and sell out every night. You know, thousand capacity venues. We just had, we were huge on this underground scene, so we were making a living from doing that. It was a small living. And it was dependent on quite a few of us having partners who had who also had jobs, which is like quite a common, uh, you know, story of a lot of creative people that it's quite often they have other people, you know, in their in their family unit who are who are who helped who help you know support them and that and a lot of us in the band had that you know and it was really and we probably couldn't have done it without that. Um, so we had that model. You know, we had that model that we were making a living. Uh, when t- when Tub Thumping happened, um, we just thought, well, it's not going to change anything that we say. And and really, that's why it ended in a way, because we were so determined to carry on saying and doing the things that we'd always said and done. And so what it meant, what it meant was that, like when we had, when you have a hit record, you get invited to join a club, basically. You know, you get enjoy, you get invited to stuff. You know, you're expected to behave in a certain way. You're expected to, like, you know, just want to be at all these parties and all these events and stuff like that. We weren't in it to do any of those things. Um, and so the the what happened with, the, you know, the Deputy Prime Minister at the Brits with Prescott, that, that more than anything, you know, put us in a, in a category where people became very, very wary of us, you know, and we, we stopped getting invited to stuff and we stopped getting uh you know packet free you know free club you know people wanting to give us free stuff and all that sort of stuff because we'd you know because we'd we'd broken the rules of being a member of the club um and you know we didn't want to be a member of that club you know that's not why we were doing it it was not to become you know it was not to be to become uh uh famous for that for that reason um i think when I was making uh, the I Get I Get Knocked Down documentary, we had this whole, there's a scene in the film which is us all discussing what happened at the Brits uh, when uh, when uh, Dambert and Alice and Paul chucked water over John Prescott. And what was, what was really refreshing was that that discussion was just a couple of years ago, that everybody, everybody was still thought it was really funny, really proud of it, and nobody regretted it, and that I thought I th- I thought that was brilliant that 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 we still stood by what we had done all those years ago, and still felt as though um, if we were in that situation, we would have done exactly the same thing, um, uh, because we weren't careerists, you know. We never we never uh, it, it wasn't our cl- you know it wasn't our club, you know. Why would I want to be a member of that club? It's full of you know. Uh, it's full of a lot of people who, you know, I just didn't want anything to do with. And we we were never about, you know, just wanting to be hobnob with celebrities.
you know, and that's why we took, uh, you know, a couple of dock workers with us to the Brits, you know, so if we were, if we'd won the award that we were up to, they would have, they would have gotten up to, to uh, uh, pick up that award and have the opportunity to talk about, you know, their, their strike, you know, as it was, we didn't win the award, but, you know, we, because of what happened, you know, there was a lot of publicity around that. And that felt, you know, that felt uh, 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 that felt really good. In fact, in the film, uh, not to give you any spoilers, but uh, we go and talk to I go and talk to Penny Rimbo from Crass, and he just actually said that that's the moment at which he thought that we um, absolved ourselves by doing that thing to Prescott, because he said nobody else would have done it and nobody else could have done it, and so um, he was like, I he was like, yeah, I thought that was. I thought that was brilliant and that made everything else you did feel worthwhile. And it did to us as well, you know, it really did. Um, you know, we were doing a lot of stuff as, as well, though, that, you know, that, that nobody knew, you know, that, that was not, you know, we were giving money away all the time to a lot of different people and we were like, you know, raising, you know, raising money for different people and, you know, talking about different struggles all the time. So our politics didn't change in the slightest, you know, it would just meant that we were in a situation where we could talk to a lot more people about that sort of thing. The music, I, to go back to the stuff about, you know, like um, the, uh, you know, the, the music for free and all that sort of stuff that never really became a thing in our world. We did do it. We did, we did put out like a free CD or something that, that was critical of, uh, do you remember Lars Ulrich trying to take somebody to court or something for like, because they'd downloaded some Metallica music illegally. I think they were on Sony or something. So yeah, I mean, I just thought that was ridiculous that they they would do something like that to you know, like a fa you know a fan. It was a fan, wasn't it? It was a fan, and they tried to sue a fan, and it was just the most hideous thing you could do. And we were appalled by that. And I think I think we'd always been sort of early adopters of uh you know technology and and acknowledge that once something like that starts once you know once the lids took off you can't put the lid back on you know that's it it's that it's it's up it's boom that's it and i think it was like that with you know with uh with napster and what then what came after that that you know you can't you can't control you know you can't have any control about that and you know, there was so there was a couple of years where it took a couple of years for everything to settle down again. I thought, and I think, I think now people have a much more responsible attitude towards you know, um, you know what what um, what you pay for and what you don't pay for and stuff like that. I think it's a lot more. Um, it's just you know, it's just how it is. And I just I I mean I have a, I suppose I have a similar approach to you in I think in what you're saying is that. Um, you know that there are some people who, who you know, like there's sometimes where I I would uh, watch it. You know, I would ask a friend to find me a film. You know, because I can't find it anywhere, and I, I don't know, and it's been and gone at the cinema, and I just want to see it. You know, and think, okay, I'm making a decision now to watch that film and not pay for it. But there, there, but then on the other hand, you know, I buy stuff that I don't, that I know that I'm not even going to listen to because I really believe in it. You know, a, you know, a friend will put a friends will put out a record, you know, and it'll be a benefit record, and they think, oh, whatever. You know, I just think I'm going to buy that. You know, I'm not bothered about listening to it. I listen to it once, maybe it's not like something that I'm listening to over and over again. But I just think you make those sort of, you know, you make those sort of decisions. You know, like what you do. You know, like who you help and who you, who you support and all that sort of thing. So I think it's like, yeah, but you know, like. A lot of what I do now is like live. It's either it's either live music or live theatre. So it's stuff that you have to come to anywhere to experience. And I think I think what I what I found when I uh, when I got a new band together in Terrabang, one of the things I loved about in Terrabang was as much as I loved performing and I loved the I loved the music we were doing. 
I really believed in it. Um, what I really loved was getting back into that, uh, you know, that that scenario where you go to a gig and you're part of a community again. And I think I think now more than ever, because of what's happened in the last couple of years, that just feels like really, really important that we come together and you know share ideas or just have fun together and have this sort of communal experience that we've been robbed of for so for for quite a few years now and i think that so i think the live experience is like i still think that's one of the most you know i think i don't think listening to a record for me i don't think listening to a record ever compares to a live you know a live experience so you know and and i use and weirdly uh, I used to think that about Chumbawamba as well. I was never, I was never that involved or passionate about uh, the making of a record of a Chumbawamba album because I knew that there was people in the band who were brilliant at producing records, and I knew there were musicians in the band who were brilliant at, 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 at you know putting all the music together. Uh, I was one of the vocalists. I really, really enjoyed that but for me nothing nothing was better than Chumbawamba playing live that to me was where all the magic happened really was was in a live situation and I think we all used to really really love playing live because of that because we had such a because the gigs were like they were like huge celebratory events and I think you know when I go and see bands now and you feel that it's you know it's an amazing experience. I've been going to see Patty Smith for over forty years now. Still, absolutely adore her. And when I go and see her, it just feels like such. It feels more than just a gig to me. It's like it's like a a, pl a place where um, you know you replenish your soul in a way. And for me. Recorded music doesn't do that for me in the same way, I suppose. So, so I sort of sidestep that. I sort of sidestep that big, you know, that big issue about you know, like Spotify or iTunes or Amazon, whatever you know, however people listen to music, however people listen to music now, because to me, my my main, you know, I where I get my energy from is from performing live or seeing other people perform live. I think that's the. That to me is where the magic happens. And it seems like the, if the question is, do you support an artist in their ability to create art and to share that and record it, you can make that decision to buy a t-shirt or send them some money or do whatever without actually going through the record company that makes a huge amount of cuts. And there's also, you know, there are individuals that do the recording that work for the studios that get paid by the um by the record labels and and such but it seems like through your experience the studio system or the way that music's distributed has shifted like two or three times and sort of changed the social rules the final straw is a proud member of the channel zero network of anarchist podcasts and here's a jingle from another member of czn from embers is a show produced about anarchist ideas and practice across so-called canada Every week we spend about an hour going in-depth about ideas, histories, and ongoing struggles that we think are important. We're a part of the Channel Zero Anarchist Podcast Network. You can check it all out at fromembers.libsyn.com. I was I was kind of hoping to get back to that question of um, are you all related to movement and where money went from some of the success that you had. I mean, even before that, you you all did a um, perf you know at least one performance that's in that documentary, um, the uh, well done now sawed off, showing you all performing at the minor strikes in '84. So you know you clearly had been a part of movement besides the content. Uh, of your music talking very like frequently about issues around gay rights, around anti-racism, anti-fascism, um, and definitely focusing on capitalism a lot. Um, could you talk a little bit about how Chumbawamba used its resources and its reach to support things like 
uh, the 18 June carnival against capitalism or indie media. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I suppose, I suppose what, I mean, it's, I mean, to catalog Chumbawamba's, you know, like timeline, you know, we started off in the eighties and we were doing like lots of animal rights, benefit gigs, um, nuclear anti 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 nuclear war sort of gigs um we were we were involved in a lot of small uh like uh campaigns at that time where we would be uh you know t- doing stuff like for anarchist groups um when the miners strike came along in 84 that sort of uh, that sort of, that was that was a sort of a massive shift in people's politics because up until that point, we'd sort of, I think we'd regarded ourselves as an, as anarcho pacifists in a way. And, and so a lot of the causes that we were, we were involved in were to do with animal rights and stuff like that. Uh, when the minor strike came along, that was, that was, that was sort of like this idea that that was a class issue and it was a class struggle and we shifted our politics shifted. And, but also the sort of benefit gigs that we did started to shift and we widened our horizons and, and so we found that that meant that um, we stopped being so isolated in our anarchist politics and started to get involved with working with other left-wing groups and organisations and with people whose, whose politics weren't may, maybe exactly the same as our own, but that we had uh, enough in common with that we realised that there was some sort of common ground and that was that was sufficient for us to work together or to raise money for quite different organisations. You know, in Britain in the in the late eighties, there was all the stuff around the poll tax, which which was this unfair tax that the uh, Tory government were trying to bring in. We did a lot of gigs around raising money for protesting against that and uh, demonstrating against that. Then, I mean, if you if you look at Chumbawamba's back catalogue, I mean, in the early days there would be a single that was about um, you know fighting a. a, a uh, a bill, an abortion bill, or um, a, a, a bill that was uh, clause twenty eight, clause twenty nine, which was um, which was basically anti LGBTQ bill that was uh, um, the sort of rearing its head again nowadays. I suppose both those sort of things are, and then we were just like we'd be t- we'd be touring a lot, and then you know there'd be like I mean like things would come along our our you know like we'd get involved in um you know we got we got involved like in the in the early nineties a lot in l g b t q issues because that's what people in the band were just like was part of their everyday existence, and so it just became a natural progression that we were then you know putting out singles that were you know like we did a single called homophobia in the 90s with uh, these Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence that were this gay nun organisation um, and stuff like that. So there was stuff like that. And so like when, um, you know, when Tub Thumping happened, we were sort of, we'd been, we would, we would already, we'd done a massive benefit for the dock workers. So it, felt, it only felt natural that we carried that on into a bigger platform. But, you know, we, you know, we'd been, we'd gotten involved in uh, the Mumia Abu Jamal campaign and so that's why when we went on letterman you know we changed the chorus to uh to that and then and then stuff came along um i don't know if the, whether you were alluding to this but it's an interesting story anyway is that this is this is sort of after tub thumping we got offered a lot of, we used to get offered you know stupid about amounts of money for for people to use the song in an advert and that was a new world to us you know we'd never experienced that before really and so General Motors wanted to use the song in an advert for a Pontiac car. And um, we'd like, we turned down loads of stuff. You know, we turned down money from Nike. We turned down money from General Electric. So we were making those sort of decisions all the time. But then this one came along and we just thought, look, why don't we take the money for the advert and then just give the money away?
And so what we did is um, we found uh, Indie Media and Corp Watch. Corp Watch were this organisation who monitored the bad working practices of companies like General Motors. And so it seemed really like it seemed it, it seemed really apposite that we use, that we give the money to them to then crit to then you know like criticize the the behavior of general motors um and that and that was and that was quite an interesting process because we got in touch with both indie media and Gen and corp watch before we did before we agreed to give the, to give a song for an advert and it took a little it took a little bit of persuading for those two organizations to accept the money you know agree to accept the money once we got it they were both a bit like uh, corp watch more than indie media actually were a bit like Oh, I'm not sure is that the ethical, you know, that, you know, you're getting money for this and then you're giving it to us. But in the end, they both agreed to accept, uh, you know, a share of this money. And then so that, so what happened on the back of that was then we then turned that into a, you know, a, a, a news, a, new, a newsworthy article, you know, article. And so garnered uh, press from the fact that we don't, we'd even done that, you know, like to, as though it was like some, uh, you know, that it was some sev clever uh, situationist prank that we'd sort of turned that idea on its head that we'd got money for an advert and then given the money away to criticise the thing that we were advertising. So we we liked, you know, that we liked that idea. We got money for uh, oh, I can't remember what it was. It was something. It was it might have been martini or something. I don't know. It was some drink or something. Anyway, we gave them we gave the money from that away to like a anarchist Italian radio station or something like that. So we were always finding opportunities to, uh, uh, you know, use our position to uh, further, you know, causes that we believed in. Because, well, I think we felt that so in a lot of, in a lot of cases we were like we were like giving voice to the voiceless in a way, and we were like being able to use our position to further the causes of stuff that we believed in. You know, people who would never get the chance to be on national television to talk about uh, their, you know, their their particular cause. I mean, on top of that, we used to just, you know, we, we you know, there was a, we, we used to give away a percentage of the money that we made to, you know, various organisations. You know, we'd have these meetings where we'd have a list of all these people who'd asked us for money and then we'd decide then we'd split up a certain amount of money, you know, every three months and give, you know, give a lot of money away. Just because we thought, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's paying back, you know, all these organisations and people who have supported us over the years as well. And we were suddenly in a position where we could do that. And it felt, it, that, it felt like, you know, yeah, it sort of felt worthy. It felt really worthy. And, uh, but at the same time, it was just like, this is brilliant. You know, we're, we're, we're helping, you know, you know, we're helping. I mean, I, I still, you know, like I still occasionally hear from people in Bristol who we helped these people in Bristol buy this building, uh, you know, to set up a social centre. And they still, you know, I still get messages from them saying, yeah, I remember when you did that. And it's funny because at the time it probably wasn't, it was probably just another thing that we helped. But, you know, to those people, it meant the world. It was a, it was an amazing opportunity to do that sort of stuff. So, so I think what, so I think what was interesting about, going back into that environment with a new band was that there was a lot of goodwill, you know, there was a lot of goodwill for, you know, like for the, for, for what I was doing, because I was like, you know, I was doing something DIY again and trying to be involved in, you know, in, in a movement on a grassroots level again, you know, and, and that was the level, you know, that when we had all that fame and fortune, we were trying to help those people, you know, we were trying, it was the very people we were trying to help way back then. So it was like it was a nice like circular thing that sort of came around. It was like it felt it felt really uh heartwarming. Do you mean with Interrobang? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, Interrobang was always just a, a small, you know, like a, a um a, a, a small passionate project that you know that we had that for a few years shone quite brightly, you know, on an independent DIY music scene in the UK. And that felt really, you know, it felt really great. I was just reading, you know, there were so many people I met, you know, from from years gone by, you know, from doing Interrobang again. It just felt really, you know, it felt like such a positive experience being part of that community again. And so I drifted away from all that. It's all that thing about making the film and um, making the film in particular. 
Like when I started making the film, I was in quite a low place. I was not feeling, you know, like I was wondering what was I doing with myself? How did I fit in, you know, to the world? And what happened was that it, it then became, it was quite a sort of, I suppose it was like quite a meta sort of thing, is, is that the film, the making the film itself became the thing that got me out of, you know, my my quagmire in a way. It was the, the thing that helped me. Um, so it was in talking about the things that I was trying to resolve that I resolved those things, if you see what I mean. It was like, it was sort of like, it was, uh, it, it helped, you know, it helped me just doing that. <clears throat> and that led on to, you know, I, 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 you know, that led on to me doing the one man show, which is a very, it's a very similar thing, you know. So those were both, uh, you know, those were, those were the, the act of creating the film helped me, you know, move on in a way. That was, that was a really positive thing for me. Yeah, and so you're still doing performances, uh, uh, if I understand, of, of, or am I invisible yet, excuse me. Could you talk about that that experience and sort of like a, another way of of reinvigorating this relationship with the audience by doing live shows and how it how it sits alongside of the documentary? Yeah, so the, the, the one-man show sort of came out of the film, in a way. Like that two years, the, the previous two years, you know, of lockdown or whatever, they were quite a they were quite a creative time for me in a way because I managed to uh, well me and Sophie who I made the film with we managed to fill finish the film editing remotely with various editors um, and we got the film finished. <coughs> Once we finished the film, we did have a discussion about what we were going to do next, um, and I'd said to, I'd said to Sophie. We'd had a brilliant time. We've had a brilliant time making the film together. She's like, she's from a completely different background. She's an amazing filmmaker. Um, she brought a lot of her talents and skills to the making of the film. I brought a lot of my, you know, just my history and, you know, just having stupid ideas that she would then make work. And that was that was a, a really brilliant um, process. Um, but when we finished the film, I said, I said to her, do you think we'll make another film together? And she said, no, nah, I don't think we will. And I thought, you know, at first I thought, I was I was like completely shocked and offended. I was like, why would you why would you not want to make another film with me? And she said, Well, because I think what we've I think what we've learned is that you need to you need to be on a stage or you need to be performing in somewhere. You don't need you're much better at that than you are being behind the camera. And she's right. She's totally right. And, uh, you know, at first I was offended that she didn't, wouldn't want to make another film with me. But then, but then what happened is that she said, look, I said, right, well, what should I do? Well, well you know, I've started writing this, this saw one man show. And she was like, look, I'll direct the one man show. I used to, she used to work in theater years ago. She says, I'll direct it. You write it, you perform it. I'll direct it. And that's what we did. You know, we did this like, and it, and it just felt like, what what the one man show enabled me to do was like take a lot of the themes that are in the film, you know, about reaching a certain age, about starting to feel as though you might be invisible, you know, and wondering what your place is in the world and how relevant are you and how do you keep on trying to be part of a movement where you're trying to change the world? You know, how do you keep on doing that? And so we took a lot of those themes from the film and I, you know, like I, I sort of brought them into the one man show as well as combining a lot of the Interrobang stuff, because um, <clears throat> what, had happened to it, what had happened with Interrobang was that that had sort of ground to a halt. And um, for one reason or another, we had stopped. Uh, uh, we couldn't do, we couldn't really do any more shows. Uh, Harry had to stop doing it. Harry was the drummer in Chumbawamba, who was also the drummer in Interrobang. He had to stop performing because he had to, he had to, care for his uh, his partner who was who was not well and um griff just couldn't find he, griff had a young family and he couldn't find the time to you know commit to the to the band and so i had to find a way of expressing myself still um and so what i did was like well, I, I i took all those elements of interrobang in the film and turned it into this one man show performance which is like music poetry prose film you know, it's a combination of all these different things, and it's me performing this thing that goes on for about an hour. Um, 
and it's worked out it's worked out really well it's a it's become a really positive uh um thing and so now and that is also something i've never done before is uh is performing that way you know i'd always been in a band and so the idea that i was stepping out of my comfort zone and doing something that i thought was you know ter- terrifying um meant that what I was doing was I was keeping those, um, you know, I was keeping the, that 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 creativity alive, um, which felt really important to me that when you get to a certain age, it's harder and harder to be part of a creative world, you know, just because um, just because there's lots of other things going on that, uh, that take up your time. And also there's less and less of a, a, a place for you in the, you know, in a, in a, in a world. Um, that's aimed more towards youth and uh, and you know and people who you know who are, who are, who are well known anyway, who have the um, have the funds to do whatever they want in a way. Um, I didn't have to, I didn't sort of have that, but I found a I found a way of doing this that I'm really uh, excited about and that really stimulates you know stimulates me, and and so the idea that we're going out and doing this show. Where I'm basically saying, look, am I invisible? You know, yet we've all had that feeling. Everybody, that's not just me. That's all of us. Everybody has had that feeling that you know they're becoming less relevant in what you do about it. And so the whole idea of the show is, it's just like this. It's it's like it's to not feel alone in a way, which I think is really important. It's to feel as though you're still part of a, you know, of a of a movement or a community. I think I mean I keep on banging on about movements and communities because uh, I do think that does that that in a world where it's really hard to affect any sort of huge change in the world, I think we have to like always uh, you know find those small victories and those you know those little things that that really keep us going in a way. And you know the the fact that you know like we embrace different adventures and. You know that we don't give up and we step outside of our comfort zone. I think those, it's, I think it's stuff like that. Part, you know, like part of the show's about this idea that we just have this one goal at life. That's it. This is our one goal. And I just feel as though you can't waste. You know, you can't waste a minute of it. You know, you've got to do something with you know with your time here. And but you've got to enjoy it as well. You know, I think I got sort of de- depressed about the fact that. It, it felt there was a time when it felt as though you were obliged to do, you know, to go on demonstrations. You were obliged to be part of, you know, various political actions, and you were you you were obliged to be, you know, angry on Facebook or Twitter all the time. And I think I took a step back from that because I realised that it wasn't particularly healthy, a healthy way of going about things, and so. You know, I made all these decisions about approaching all those sort of things in a different way, which was really, which was really good for me. And it's turned out really, you know, it's turned out really positive for me, I suppose. And it's, you know, in making the film, it's what's really encouraging about that is that there's a lot of love for Chumbawamba in the world. Even though, even though um, we felt at the time that, you know, everybody hated Chumbawamba and there was only a small amount of people who actually, uh, you know, who liked us. I've sort of realised over the years that that's not the case. You know, there's a lot of love out there for the band. And that's really, you know, that's that's a gorgeous thing for me. You know, like, cause it feels as though, it feels, that, that helps me feel as though, okay, I'm trying to do something now, but, you know, th- that still resonates for a lot of people. That song was 25 years ago now. You know, and that and it still resonates for people. It's the people like last week before we did this before we did our our we before we did the one man show, me and Sophie went leafleting in Brighton to try and get people to come along to the show. And it's it's a thankless task, leafleting. There's there's no fun in it at all. So Sophie started doing this thing where she'd give people leaflets for the show and I'd be stood behind her and she'd just go, Do you know who he is? And then and then they'd go, no. And then she'd go, he's the guy from the song. You know, he's the guy from the, you know, the I get knocked down guy. And honestly, there's people, you know, just like middle-aged people would just be like, no way. And they'd be absolutely delighted. And they'd have a story about how that song, had, you know, had, was still resonating now. 
There was one couple who, who Sophie did this to. One of them, one of them had in his phone, he showed us his phone and his son, he calls his son Tub Thumper on his phone. <laughs> because back then, 25 years ago, it's, they, they were really laughing about the, the, when, he was a li- when he was a little kid, he just used to fall over and get back up again. So they called him Tub Thumper. And he was, and they still called him that, and it meant so it meant something to him. It was just really funny. And then we met these other two guys, and they were the same, and they were like had this whole story about you know twenty five years ago, what that song meant to him and stuff like that. And it's just that it's like really to me that's really touching. I really like that, you know. I really like that, and it made that whole experience of doing something as excruciating as leafleting. It, it meant it felt that that day that. I'd sort of like achieved something just by finding some common ground with these people. And, you know, all they wanted, you know, all they wanted was a, a selfie with me. You know, that's all they wanted was to take a photo to send to the mates and say, look, look who I'm with. I'm with this guy. You know, I don't mind. You know, I don't mind about that. In the same way, in the same way that I'm not in the slightest bit embarrassed or ashamed about the song. I'm really proud of the song. I'm really, really proud of it. And I know it ends up in lists of the 10 most irritating songs ever written. I don't give a shit about that. I don't care about that because I know that there's, there's people out there that that song just means something to. And that is the power of music. And I love that. I love the fact that music can be such a powerful force for good, you know, and it can bring people together in that sort of way. I think that's a brilliant thing. So I'm really proud of the I'm really proud of the song. I don't think it's Chumbawamba's best song by a long chalk. You know, I don't think it's I don't think it's yeah, I don't think in any way it is. But I love it for what it has, you know, partly what it's enabled me to do on the back of it and the way it's touched people's lives in completely different ways. You know, because we get we still get letters from people saying, you know, it seems really inappropriate, but people play at funerals. I and mean, it seems like such a strange choice. Praying for the praying. resurrection, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it must be. But it gets played at all these different, you know, like weddings, you know, I don't know, birthday parties, all sorts of stuff where people are like, oh, yeah, that was my song. You know, I remember that song, blah, 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 blah. I think that's great. And I think that's uh, to enter popular culture in such a way, I think is something that Chumbawamba always hoped we would achieve. You know that we would be that we would be able to have some sort of you know leave a footprint, and um, if that means that people go off and find other stuff, other interesting stuff, or get involved in other things, I think that's a really I think that's a really good thing. Uh, and and it, and it and it's at, at its sort of lowest co- common denominator point, people really enjoy the song and have a really good time dancing to it and stuff like that. And it brings back really good memories for people, I think. So yeah. in that sense, you know, I'm really proud of it. So I think it's, it's. I'd like to know a little bit around how you feel about, like mostly like anarchists as a movement, as a, a gaggle of freaks, we tend to sort of shun the idea of people taking space and being public and, and fame is a weird Fame is a weird thing. We did definitely among anarchists and among punks and uh, these variant and related groupings at sometimes will revere an individual or a group and their contributions. And at the same time, I think we have a pretty healthy aversion to putting too much, putting too much, putting people too much on a pedestal or making too much out of them. And, um, I wonder, like, for you, like, that's obviously you've mentioned the contribution that you all gave that people, it's giving you a connection to people nowadays who you would not have met if you had just stayed playing anarcho punk um, stuff that yeah. is like, it's fun for me to listen to, but a lot of people, my parents would just kind of like cringe a little bit at. And then 20 years later, you know, having a, a well, one person show, one man show called Am I Invisible Yet? Like, I guess I'm kind of, I'm wondering. What sort of insights do you have about intergenerationality and social and political movements and how you keep involved and how you try to engage with younger folks and bridge that gap? I think social movements have to be, if if they're going to be contiguous, if we are actually going to change the world in the way that you described, 
it's going to take, you know, not just one flash in the pan, really good pop song. So uh, how, yeah. how do you stay involved in like, how do you, or what sort of difficulties have you found of keeping engaged besides being busy with work and with family and stuff like that with new people yeah. coming in the movement? Yeah. That, I think what happened to me was that, um, I sort of dropped out of all that, you know, and and that was because I had kids, you know, little kids, you know, and I spent, you know, they became my focus and trying to get a new, you know, like try and decide what I was going to do after, you know, after um, Chumbawamba. That was sort of quite a difficult time for me. But then, but then um, I think, I think what happened was that I started working with the band in Brighton called The Levelers. Now, The Levelers are, 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 are huge in their own way. They're, they've never been particularly mainstream, but they've got a huge following. And uh, I made a I made a documentary about them. Uh, I was sort of friends with them years ago, and I met back up with them, and then I made a film. I worked for them for a while, and I, then I made a film for them. That showed me, that sort of showed me that there was a lot of people out there who were still, um, you know, who were, who, were, who were growing old, you know, disgracefully or gracefully, uh, but still being involved in, uh, you know, political movements and still uh, doing stuff. But what was interesting was that their children were coming to Leveller's gigs as well. And there was this whole new generation where, you know, these parents were sort of bringing their kids to gigs. And I thought that was really interesting. I thought I found that really interesting. I thought, oh, that's interesting that there's, and they're influencing their kids, and the kids are getting into their own their own stuff, and you know, finding something in this, not in a nostalgic way, which the parents are doing in a nostalgic way, but to this new generation, it was something new. So I found that quite interesting. But then, but then I met. Was it first? Yeah. So I met this, uh, I, I met various, I met various people, you know, on the back of that and were involved in that. And then that led to me meeting other people and other bands that were still doing stuff that were my generation. But then, but then this, this movement sort of blossomed in London. Well, it started in London. It felt like it started in London because a friend of mine, Cassie Fox, set up this thing called Loud Women. And, um, it was a response to the fact that festivals were like 90% male performers and there was no, there was like such a small space for women to get up and perform. So she set up her own fest. She basically set up her own festival with a few friends called loud women festival. And I sort of, I didn't become involved in the organization of the festival, but I came, became involved in the whole the whole thing, that whole thing that was going on, and became friends with a lot of the bands that were, uh, you know, you know, getting involved in that. Because I just found them really inspiring. Because it was this younger generation of women who were finding their voices and finding an outlet to um, express themselves in such a way that just felt really powerful. And this was at a time. This was sort of post. Pussy Riot, getting a lot of publicity for the, you know, what they did in the church, the Orthodox Church thing. And so I would just like thought, this, this is amazing. It's like, it's like these women are finding, are, are, are finally finding, you know, have, have pushed open the, you know, pushed, kicked open the doors, in fact, and have found a way in and have sort of, have sort of are taking back control. And it just felt really fucking inspiring. And I, you know, I just thought, and at that time, you know, this idea of being an ally became a big thing. And I just thought, yeah, that's, this is, this the timing of all this is brilliant, you know? And I just thought, I thought, yeah, my, I felt at that time that <clears throat> my role was to be an ally with everything that was, you know, to help in whatever way I could, you know, um, and get involved, you know, get involved in a way where I wasn't trying to take the limelight, you know, but I was completely felt inspired by these people. And then, of course, there was stuff like, you know, Greta Thunberg and Tamika Mallory and um, Ella Gonzalez. There was all these, like, young women who were just, 
becoming really vocal and and visible and i just thought this is this there's something happening here that i felt as i hadn't have ha- hadn't happened before and that just felt like it felt like a moment where things had a twist had shifted massively where i was now uh, 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 an older you know white man who was now like finding getting his inspiration from you know these from a lot of you know like from a lot of other other younger you know uh, differently gendered people and i just found that i just thought this is brilliant this is really great i just it really energized me you know like and really really made me think about you know like the fact that yes there is a there is a move you know there's a movement here and there's a lot of people and it and it felt like it felt like a, an, it was underground but it, that it was voluntarily it felt voluntarily underground and that it didn't necessarily want to be mainstream and i thought that was a really good starting point for you know like to for for people finding a voice and finding um a movement you know a movement to be involved in and i i found that loud that loud women thing is still going strong you know and a lot a lot of brilliant stuff has come has come out of that um and i just i just think that's a i think that's a brilliant uh uh that to me was something that i brought out that i bring up in the film and i also bring up in the one man show that that is you know that that's happening and i just think for once you know like what's happening is that we're not looking we're not looking to you know like old uh, you know we're not looking to an older generation for the answers we're looking for the, to the younger generation for the answers this is this whole thing that my, a friend of mine coined this phrase generation left which was all about this idea that that now you know it's the younger people are, are more likely to have left wing politics and express left wing ideas and it's it's our, it's my generation that you know become more right wing and you know more middle of the road and i think what, and i think what all that made me think was don't ever let yourself you know fall into that trap of being middle of the road uh, you know just to always you know be aware of what's going on around you and you know there's lots of stuff that's going on you know with that younger generation that you know i admit i can't keep up with it all a lot of the time you know my daughter is 19 she's absolutely all over it she know you know she un- she understands the the subtleties of you know everything to do with you know like that the you know that generation you know I- inheriting a world that's an absolute you know sure i suppose but i find you know i find what she's doing really you know the way she talks about stuff and the passion she has for you know what she believes in i find that really inspiring to me and i, I like the idea that you never stop learning in and the fact that you're learning from a younger generation, I think is really, because uh, I remember being her age, you know, and a little, even a little bit older and just being, being so idealistic and so like, you know, like, so, so like, you know, determined that I was going to change the world. And I find it inspiring that that, you know, that there's a younger generation who's, who feel like that. So, you know, like all that climate, you know, that climate change movement that came about a few years ago, I thought that was a brilliant, you know, starting point. Uh, very important you know because it's you know it's one it's one of the biggest things that you know that you know that's going to kill the planet i suppose um i just thought that was brilliant that that was such a such a huge rallying point and you know and 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 seeing like seeing young people you know take you know get involved in the black lives matter movement i thought it was just i mean to me it was just incredible you know, because we had like when I was that age, we had like you know anti-Nazi league and Rock Against Racism, and those those were things those were things that politicised me. You know, back in the seventies, that's what you know. That's where I found my politics through the bands I was into and what their politics were. You know, like so it was stuff like the Clash. You know, doing Rock Against Racism gigs and me working out what that was all about. You know, that I thought, all oh, right, yeah, yeah, I agree with you know, like I agree with that. You know, like I want to be you know, like. If just you know, if just other things that you know, you must be there must be something in that, and you go off and find your own, you know, you form your own ideas and stuff like that. But the the jumping off point was like bands who would you were saying stuff, and now I think there's a new generation of bands who are doing that again. Sorry, I waffle on for ages. <laughs> there's no waffling <laughs> there, but um, yeah, 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 and I think that like for me, and I'm 
I'm in my 40s. Um, I'm no spring chicken. Like, I think it's super inspiring personally to um, to see, for instance, like the movement for Black Lives, the anti-fascist organizing that's been happening in, in my country for, you know, visibly in this last wave for the last seven years or so. Like, that stuff is built on what was there before. Like, before people were calling themselves anti-fascist here, there was anti-racist action. There were other groupings. And you can just look yeah. back for inspiration. And though the struggle might look different at a specific moment— it's it's going like there's so much still to learn from how you know there were people doing earth first and elf and alf actions that you were talking about in the the 80s and 90s in the uk people doing i mean xr has its you, know, you can bring a lot of criticisms to it but a lot of action to try to bring attention and and stop the eco side that's going on now just like yeah. you had national front at a certain point and then you know national action people were fighting both of those movements and there's a lot there's a lot that i think every generation can get from being able to tap someone on the shoulder from a prior generation and say you saw something like this how did you fight what weaknesses like what mistakes did you make and sort of learning off of that so like what you say that that's kind of what i feel about when you're talking about your daughter's interactions and 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 the the current like feminist uprising like i think that's it's super inspiring to be able to look back and forth yeah, and yeah. see we're not just alone you know yeah yeah I, I i mean yeah i mean all the stuff that's happening yeah that feminist uprising thing that you talk about i think that's really to me it's really inspiring because i think there was there was pushback against that massively you know like um the, you know like an almost, an almost anti-feminist sort of movement but um and i think I think I think I think those people I think those people have, have been vindicated in you know in in in, in continuing that struggle. Um, you know, there's so much stuff that's happened in the last. You know, all the you know, like even, you know, even all the Me Too stuff. You know, like that. What's that? What that is? What that has exposed is you know is incredible. You know. Um, my my laptop is going to die in a minute, and um, I might have to. It is half past four now i might have to go yeah um uh, is that okay absolutely yeah and thanks so much for taking the time i've really enjoyed i, I of course had more questions but uh i could have gone on all day oh <laughs> can we <laughs> not can really we rattle through some others i have work in a half an hour so i like by saying oh, i could go through all day like i i'm not going to ask you to but Dustin, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you, and I look forward to getting to see the film once it has distribution. Where can people find out how to how to how to get a hold of it? Do you have a a website or a social media presence that you want to point people to where you'll be announcing when it when it hits the hit the screens where people are at? Um, yeah, there's a there's a yeah. Oh, I'm useless. At all. I mean, just useless at all that sort of thing. There's a there's a. I think there's an Instagram. I get knocked at IGKD, it might be. Um, there's a Facebook page. There might be I get knocked down film or something like that. I'm really bad at social media. I'm really, really bad at it. It's terrible. It's bad to us. I'll find I'll find the links and then I'll, I'll put them in. Okay. And I'll mention oh, it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, hey, it's been a pleasure and I hope you enjoy the show tonight. And again, thanks a lot for thank you. chatting. Yeah, check out Bob Villain. He's like, he's like, he's like a big. He's going to be big over. Well, he's doing really well over here, but he's like, uh, he's quite interesting. I'm interested in seeing him. Yeah. Tonight. I'm excited for. That. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. cheers, man. Cheers. Okay. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Ciao. Bye. If you would like to support The Final Straw, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow and share our materials online, as well as give us feedback via the links at thsr.wtf slash tree, as in link tree. To support our transcription work and wider project, you can subscribe to us via patreon.com slash tfsr. You can also buy some merch or find donation methods at tfsr.wtf slash support. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. The following is a list of all those who were murdered in October of 2021 due to their interactions with police. May they rest in power, and may every cop rot. Buster Lee Carpenter. Devlin Ramel Addison. Fanon Michaud. 
James Michael Ferris, Jason Metcalf, Khalil Singletary, name withheld by police, Eric Augustine Orduna, Jasmine Thien, Jose Gonzalez, Robin Daniel Morell, Wade Anthony Adams Sr., Adrian Zarat Cervantes, Christopher Mosco, David Lee Jacques Jr., Janelle Natasha Gardner, Jess Arthur Jackson, Nick Rodriguez, Paula Kennedy, Chad Allen Jenkins, Darian Taylor, Demetrius Roberts, Michael A. Craig, Paul J. Whedon, R. V. Johnson II, Shane E. Hartman, Corey Daniel Wellman, Daniel Garcia, Dante Lorenzo Laster, Jesse Madrano, Kimar Marmar D. Thomas, Name withheld by police. Peter M. Rose. Nick Barker. Tom Sharkey. Andra Devon Murphy. Antonio Armstrong. Caleb House. Cody James Herman. Simran S. Gordon. Fidel Bedola, Guillermo San Miguel Sanchez, Johan Quintero, Kevin M. Serpa, Lloyd Grant McClung Jr., Derek Clinton II, Isaac Luis Soria, Matthew Allen Marston, Name withheld by police. Ramon Jarvis Dwight. Rudy Anderson. Scott W. Hottinger. Tommy Carmichael. Lance Richard Stelzer. Demetrio Antos Jackson. Calvin Robinson. Gilbert Lee Collison, Jr. Gustavo Angel Esparza. Jawan James Ginyard. Mikey Carruthers. Richard Lee Sweet. Timothy Wayne Houston. Travis Daniel Carlin. Isaiah Raider Guevara. Josh Edward Ebinger, Michael Robert Beck, Perry Lamar Stringfellow Jr., Kenneth Anderson Jr., Javon Lewis Singleton, Jermaine Marshall Jones Jr., name withheld by police. Name withheld by police. Brian Calvin Lee. Jonathan Zachary Combs. Mario Lawrence Martinez. Bobby Joe Klum. Buddy Byron McKenzie. Carlos Arias. Dustin J. Paradis, George Anthony Dowdell, name withheld by police, 
Stephen David Schumann, Christopher Ryan Vasquez, Jamie Ling, Jim Rogers, Christopher Ryan Vasquez, Jermaine Anthony Harris, Robert Allen Menes, Russell Differ Christopher Leggett Jr. Mary Delenti, Michael Edward Nelson Jr. Alexander King, Cody Wayne Perilla, Guillermo Gonzalez Gonzalez, Joshua Dwayne Hammock, Louis Ernest Massingale II, Dei Huang Vu, Alan Lorenzo Robb, Christopher Kaysen Connor Sr., Jugl Douglas J. Nakmus, Kafin Carew, Mike C. Beaver, DeAndre Johnson, Shane Delamore Dempsey, Rainer Sommer, Tishara Pug, Betty Jane Tibaldi, Carrie Hammond, Daniel Luis DeMillo, name withheld by police, Ricky Thomas, Shavaz Levon Seals, Starlin Manuel Diaz Felipe, Dulce Maria Castro Perez, Gustavo Mosqueda Ortega, Aaron Leo Lang, Allison Lakey, Jarvis Jarrett, Jesse Joseph Fisher, name withheld by police, J.M. Brian Morales, Jamal Smurphy Parrish Mitchell, Carissa E. Paranto, Marvin Edward Peanut Honey, Michael Raymond Hilton, name withheld by police, name withheld by police, Christian Valadez, Gregory Jean Goodall, name withheld by police, Jordane Rodriguez Perez, Lance James Hines, name withheld by police, Melvin Eugene Simpson, Claiborne Elwood Grant, Leon T. Perry, Jade Champagne, Kim Douglas Ropp, name withheld by police, Arthur Hunt, Nicholas Deshaun Smith, Curtis Armstead Jr., Miguel Quell Dequan Jenkins, name withheld by police, Corey Timothy Stanley, Jacob Bergquist, John Rudy Bush, Christopher M. Kramer, Name withheld by police. Bobby E. Nyberger. Aylin Nicole Heaney. Sean Donahue. Ivan Foster. Coffee Zima. Name withheld by police. Scott S. Wright. Marva. Eileen Eichels, Robert Bruce Rickert, Zachary W. Snow, Ahmed Akim Abdul Muhammad, Dewey D. Wilfong III, Elwood Joseph Dwyer Jr., 
Name withheld by police. Joe William Gold. Name withheld by police. Elizabeth Bellow. Joanne B. Shields. Justin A. Frosted. Sean Michael Passwater. Joseph Shane Endicott. Matthew James Riggs. Jason Jones. Glenn William Custer. Melkin Michaelidis. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case hear his past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org Psst. You can cash app dollar sign Swainiac 1969 or send dough to us and comment that it's for Swain's defense. More info is also available on Instagram at at Swainiac 1969 or Twitter at at Swain Rocks. This is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.